Welcome back, pet parents. I am always excited to bring you something new and different, especially when that new or different is something that we can all do, that we can all utilize. We don't have to go find somebody special. We can do this like at home, just us and our pets. And so I'm really excited to bring today's guest to you. She is a veterinarian in the beautiful state of Hawaii. Her name is Dr. Megan Barrett. And just in case you happen to be new here, my name is Jessica. I'm a certified canine nutritionist, holistic pet health coach, positive reinforcement dog trainer, and I also am the host of this podcast that you are listening to right now. So Dr. Barrett, thank you so much for joining us today. Would you mind just introducing yourself a little bit and tell me how, I always like to know why people decided to become a veterinarian. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, firstly. Um, okay. Like you said, I'm a veterinarian in Hawaii, and this is where I was born and raised, grew up here in the state of Hawaii. Um, I went off to Colorado to go to veterinary school, and um, I've been back for the past several years and practicing back in my home state. So, um, yeah, my path to getting to where I am now, it was influenced quite a bit by my godmother. She is a uh, marine animal veterinarian, and so... I met her when I was a child and uh, she was my babysitter. My parents were both musicians in the Hawaii Symphony. And so they would work at night and um, have to go to rehearsals and concerts. And so I was often left with the babysitter. And um, I just happened to have a really amazing babysitter who was a um, dolphin husbandry expert. So basically she took care of dolphins at a research lab. And so... Um, it's really cool because, you know, getting to have a babysitter like that was like Mary Poppins, you know, like, oh my God, you're the coolest person ever. Um, I want to be you when I grow up. And so um, when I was, uh, she, like I said, I was so obsessed with her that she, when I got baptized, she was my godmother um, at that time. And so um, when I was 10, she left to go off to veterinary school at Colorado State. And uh, she, had a really amazing path and, you know, got to do all the cool stuff in Colorado, you know, volunteer as a vet student at the Wolf Sanctuary and, you know, do all the cool things that are unique to Colorado. So my dream was to go follow in her footsteps and do that. And then eventually she, once graduating, circled back into marine animal medicine and that's what she's doing now. And so, um, you know, having someone like that to inspire me throughout life was huge and so even though I veered off in different directions um, as my life went on, that was the path that I ultimately followed in is going to Colorado State and becoming a veterinarian. Now, um, part of what I do is working with marine animals, actually, um, here in Hawaii. But um, the other part of what I do is my own practice, which is a um, holistic medical practice. We focus on acupuncture and physical therapy for dogs, um, as well as different modalities like using herbs and sound therapy and just all the different uh, complementary things that can be beneficial in addition to your you know, Western medical uh, team for the kind of emergencies and acute care type of things, uh, sometimes for like the chronic illnesses or just trying to have a... Um, a nice holistic lifestyle. That's where I come in to try to help with preventative care and making sure that the um, home environment and the family unit is balanced and, and healthy. There's so much to unpack there. First of all, <laughs> that is like the coolest story possibly ever outside of maybe Rita Hogan, who isn't a veterinarian, but she kind of grew up like she's pretty cool, like a quintessential hippie. <laughs> like, who wouldn't want to grow up like that, right? Um, but that's such an awesome story. And to have somebody that you looked up to growing up as you were growing up who took care of dolphins, like that is just the most amazing thing. I think when, yeah. when we're little, I don't know. I mean, at least for me, maybe I'm just one of these weirdos, maybe like you, that <laughs> my entire life I have just been obsessed with various animals. And that's all I've ever wanted to know about is like, how how it works how it all works for them and and what makes them tick yeah. and how smart just, they are they're just, yeah. they're just the coolest things on earth i think yes and also like as i grow older how how much i realized we 
um, as humans are very short-sighted on how we treat and understand animals in general. Um, so I kind of wish I could go back to being a kid where it was all just like the wonder <laughs> of the animals. But I, I, I want to talk to you about something very special that you do. So I'm just going to kind of tease it for a minute because you do something very special with sound and music. And that's really why I asked you on the podcast today. But before we get there, um, you brought up something that I think most Western med traditional, what we think of as like traditional veterinarians have a hard time with. At least the ones that find me on social media. <laughs> the ones that find me on social media are usually the ones that are telling me that everything holistic is dangerous and the information you're putting out is dangerous and people just need to listen to their veterinarian and do exactly what their veterinarian tells them to do. And I'm not argumentative about that because I think even... You know, I mean, the veterinarian, veterinarians who do project, practice Western medicine, they play a very important role, as you just said. Like, we need their information, their knowledge, their wisdom. We need what they practice. We need that. But we also need the, the balance of it, which is more what you do. Would you mind talking just a little bit about that and how you came to that reality? maybe or how how that has worked out like in your paradigm how you've gotten there for sure yeah you know in um, my veterinary training you know any vet school you go to is going to be predominantly western medicine and so um you learn a lot of the techniques like i said for the you know acute care um in terms of illnesses injuries emergencies because that is a lot of the time you know what a pet is going to be brought into the hospital is for that type of thing um, and that those are important for any vet who's a licensed doctor to know how to handle and be equipped to do that. But um, the other thing that people bring in their pets for are other symptoms that can be more subtle and can be harder to treat in the Western paradigm, um, simply because sometimes the root cause is not as clear and obvious. So, for example, you know, if your dog eats a ball and it swallows it, we know the root cause is there's a foreign body and it needs to be removed. It's like cut and dry. But maybe your pet is starting to have more subtle symptoms like they're eating less, they're more you know you notice that they're picky with their food or they're um they're itchy, but like you know, they're just starting to itch out of nowhere and you don't know why. Like you don't know of anything that happened to kind of change in the environment. So you're kind of like, well what's going on? Or um, maybe you just notice them gradually slowing down and, you know, you, you're noticing these changes in your pet, whether they're getting older or, or just seeing these changes happen. Um, the way that most hospitals work is you get about 10 to 20 minutes with your veterinarian. You know, you have an intake with a technician and then you get several minutes to talk to the vet and they're going to try to make a treatment plan quickly and prescribe something and, you know, have to move on to the next patient because the schedules get very full and booked. But what that doesn't provide is the space and time for that doctor to get to know you and your pet and what your whole big picture of your life and household is and your lifestyle. And a lot of times for the more subtle symptoms or emerging problems, we have to look deeper and spend sometimes an hour or an hour and a half stop talking to someone and getting to know, you know, what everything that's going on um, in that pet's life, even leading up to this point and how those factors may have contributed to where we're at now. And so um, in the times, the years that I've spent working in a Western medical practice, I felt very limited by the way that things were scheduled. Um, and it's just very hard to work it into that business model where you're going to have enough time with those patients and the clients to get to know, to, to know what they need. And so um, in trying to treat, especially those chronic illnesses or subtle illnesses, you just need more time. And so it's a different model of working that is necessary. And um, I think that 
even if a Western doctor wants to provide that, if they're an employee at a hospital, it's very hard to 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 work that in. And so that's a big reason why I created my own practice was just to have a structure that worked for me so that I could be more helpful in that way and have longer appointment times. That's that's real, about a lot of what it comes down to is just not having the time to to dive in and figure out all the things that could be contributing. Yeah. How much of your upbringing and the influence that your godmother had on you do you think contributed to you even being open to more holistic modalities? Yeah, that's a good point. So it's really cool because um, the facility that she works at, I got to spend some time working at with her when I was in vet school. And so I got to see how the animals were treated. And there's a lot of um, older animals, you know, dolphins and sea lions at the place where she works. And so a lot of them are on nutritional supplements and different things that are not just medications. There are um, many types of nutraceuticals and supplements that you can use to, you know, help maintain their health. And that was a one of the early on like aha moments of like, oh, wow, you can even use supplements in, you know, animals that aren't just pets or even animals in general to help to maintain their health, you know, that their eye health and kidney health and things like that. So seeing that um, she had a holistic approach too, because her mother was a um, holistic practitioner for humans. And so, you know, that was a big influence. And then also um, at CSU, one of the really awesome things they have are different clubs for the students to join to pursue different interests. So one of them was a holistic medical club. They also had the pain management and um, I was really active in those. And so they would bring in speakers of local holistic vets who would talk about the way that they practiced and um, the modalities that they used. And it was an instant attraction for me just to feel like um, you're kind of using these more like ancient techniques and, you know, acupuncture and herbal medicine and things like that, that are just a little bit more classic and tested by time. Um, even though, uh, you know, the, the modern modalities don't always recognize it. I think that there's more research being done to verify the validity of things that have been observed over hundreds of years. And now they're seeing um, how it's like, oh, science actually can verify why this is working on a cellular level even though, you know, we know that it works. So that kind of brings me around to one of the things that, well, first of all, I'm going to just keep teasing the sound thing. I have been following you on social media since I got to meet you at AHVMA last year, um, which was awesome. It was so nice to meet you in person. And one of the things that I've noticed on your social media is that you are very nutrition forward. And that's one of the things that you give to your subscribers is information on nutrition and helping them out. And I, I, I've seen a lot for cats. I think you, I'm sure you do dogs too. And that's something that I touch on on this podcast very consistently because I think it's like the foundation of health is what, you know, we what we fuel ourselves with is kind of what we're made of. And so can you tell me a little bit about um, your viewpoint on nutrition and how you use that in your practice and what you do with your social media as far as, you know, supporting people and making better decisions about nutrition? Definitely. Well, I love nutrition also. I feel like I took nutrition so many times in, in college because you know, it was like, first I took the human nutrition class, then I took animal nutrition class leading up to vet school, then you take more nutrition in vet school. And so, you know, it's like, nutrition's a tough subject. And so you really have to like, learn it over and over to get all the details beaten into your brain and like, really start to remember everything. So I always had an interest in nutrition and um, kind of dabbled or like thought about maybe being a human nutritionist. But you know, didn't go that route. So once I started to realize that, um, you know, I, I think there is a lot of fear created around home cooked diets, because there is a right and a wrong way to do it. Um, if you feed animals, the type of meal like we would eat, especially like a dog, you know, if you give them like a piece of meat and some vegetables and 
some grain, they're probably not going to get everything that they need from that. And, um, you know, it's a whole rabbit hole of like, we all, we all are probably nutritionally deficient too, <laughs> as people. And as my own health journey of like seeing a functional medicine doctor, she's like, yeah, you're in things. So I need to take supplements even to make sure I'm getting my trace minerals. And, um, I think we all assume that like a human meal is perfect because that's what we eat and we're fine. But when you really dive into it, um, I think we all could do more to make sure we're getting optimal nutrition. And so, um, yeah, my big gripe is just that, you know, it's become so normalized to feed pets packaged processed food and it's become normalized for people to eat that too. You know, I know friends who I grew up with who like eat all of their food from fast food restaurants or like the gas station. And that's just, that's fine for them. And that's what they want to do. But for myself, you know, I knew that that wasn't going to work as I got older. Like I could eat junk all day long when I was younger. And now it, it doesn't make me feel good anymore. And my father had cancer and he passed away. And I think that a contributing factor to, to that was his nutrition. You know, he struggled with some things with that. So, um, you know, the more I've learned and studied and looked I think a big problem is just the fact that the modern uh, modern diet that we're eating for humans and animals is gotten very far away from what real food is. You know, real food goes bad after five days. Like it's it's good and then it rots and it's then it turns back into you know biological matter. Um, but if you have food that can sit on a shelf for two years in a bag or a box and like not change there's there's just something weird about that and um you know intuitively if you're looking at it from more of like an ancestral point of view so that's become normal like a lot of people we shop in the aisles of the grocery stores and we're getting wheat thins and cheerios it's like yay it can sit in the pantry forever and like not go bad but you know there's something that doesn't add up to me and so as i've dove further into my own paradigm of like I think the, the fresher whole foods are what support our health the most. Um, it's what your body can absorb and digest. And a lot of times if you're supporting more of like a um, sustainable regenerative agriculture and using your um, purchasing power to support those types of products that you're getting, that is also a nice way to feel like you're contributing to something good. Because a lot of times if you're buying um, pre-packaged processed food, it's, you don't know where any of the ingredients are coming from. You know, even if they're coming from good sources, like you can't individually choose a local farmer or something like that. So like you said, there's so much to unpack there, but um, in my social media, I do try to just promote that overall, like my common sense approach, which is like, let's just try to get back to what animals were eating before the industrial revolution of like, uh, having factory produced foods and um, look at what they would eat in nature. Like for example, cats, they eat mice and birds and those types of prey animals. So I try to steer everyone away from dry food if they can with eating kibble. It's just, it's like a human created uh, concoction that has nothing to do with what a cat would have eaten unless they were like scavenging in the trash can and eating whatever, you know, whatever stuff they found, it wouldn't be something that they would hunt for and, and catch and ingest and be nourished by the meat and the, the bones and the feathers, you know, all the, the ways that they get their fiber and all that naturally. So, um, you know, I, I try to make sure that people are at least feeding moist foods, if not cooked or raw food for cats, you know, protein heavy, um, minimizing the carbs. And then for dogs, kind of similar of just making sure that it's a fresh whole food diet. Um, you're adding in the appropriate supplements. You're using recipes that have been um, kind of looked at critically and made sure to include the things that are commonly missing, like calcium and trace minerals, um, some vitamins also need to be added in. But um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's hard because there's a lot of information out there. And I know that people get confused and overwhelmed but um it, it's just a learning curve and so you know everyone has to go at their own pace and just find 
resources that they trust and that resonate and feel good to them and then try to you know stick with that and hopefully have a veterinarian that is at least open-minded and willing to have a conversation with them and support what they're doing whether it is a little bit unconventional or not yeah that's one of the biggest hurdles that i find on social media um is that people certain people you're always going to get trolls but certain people just have such a hard time i think trusting and figuring out who to trust and where to turn and and what to look for like they don't they don't know what they don't know and so people are and probably rightfully so because social media the internet in general is is a really cult thing to kind of navigate anymore yeah. it's a lot of work to learn this new information too like you know you're maybe just got a dog and you're like oh yeah I, I just thought I would get this dog and I would give them kibble and like everything would be fine now I have to learn all this stuff about nutrition like this is way more than I thought it was going to be so I think that that's another you know some people are really like up for that and others get frustrated more easily and they're like I'm just there's just too much information everyone's saying different things so I think yeah. if you're that type of person it would be important to try to find a holistic vet to work with one-on-one -on -one. and you know there's the AHPMA website has a directory and so uh, finding a vet in your state is important because you know even with COVID and the lacks with telemedicine that occurred during that time really you really are supposed to be working with a vet that's licensed in your state and making sure that um, you know you're seeing them in person once a year for an exam so that they're practicing within a legal scope and so there are holistic vets in every state I'm pretty sure almost every state has at least one holistic vet so looking for someone who is out there who can support you and Give you some hand holding if that's what you need so that you feel confident in what you're doing yeah i think that's really good advice too so when we think about all of the different holistic modalities one that you're very passionate about is am i saying it right if i call it sound therapy yeah kind of <laughs> and i know there are so, so there are so many different modalities uh, different things that we can do with our pets from i mean there's homeopathy and there's um you know color therapy and you know crystals and there's i mean there's so many things that we can be doing and we can utilize with our pets and you've probably already answered this because your your parents were both um musicians is that kind of where this came from yeah, so I've been, yeah, because of them, I grew up with music and um, started playing violin when I was like three years old and then learned flute. And then in high school, I played bass in a jazz group at my high school. And then I learned like drums and guitar and piano. And um, then I became a DJ and a music producer. <laughs> so it's been like a lifelong journey. But then now my latest instrument is the harp, which you can see behind me. And so um, I've totally fallen in love with the harp and it's it's become really fun because, um, you know, kind of going back to where it started is um, since I became a vet, I was certified in acupuncture and that was like the thing I really wanted to do. And, you know, um, I was lucky to work at a Western practice that allowed me to do acupuncture appointments and kind of um, hop back and forth between those different modalities. and ways of practicing the tricky thing is that when you're doing acupuncture in a hospital you know it's not the most like calming environment because you know you're even if you're in a closed room um there's noises from outside of the room there are the smells of like the previous animals that were just in there it's hard sometimes to like have the whole aromatherapy setup going and the some nice music playing and stuff like when you're just trying to like be kind of quick about everything and like you know get in and get started and so um you know the, the the point is that there's a lot of noise pollution in that type of setting even like just the lighting with the fluorescent lighting it's like trying to bring an animal like a dog or cat in and get them settled they're not just gonna like lay down on a table like a person would and fall asleep like that's what most people they get acupuncture you lay down you maybe lay there for 40 minutes with your needles in and then 
you feel good and you go. But for the animals, they're just like, where am I? And like, why was I in the car? Like, who are all these animals I can smell in here? And like, what is going on? So you're lucky if they even sit still for the treatment. And so, you know, I always have to have a technician holding and there's just a lot of things that are not ideal about it, even though, you know, we're doing our best. So my, as I had all these hours and hours of treatment time, you know, I would be like imagining my ideal scenario. I'm like, oh, what would it be like if I could just do this in the most perfect environment? So I would imagine like a garden with like a little waterfall and a stream. And, you know, there's like lavender aroma going and some nice music playing. Everyone's just like, oh, this is, this is so good. And it's like healing for everyone involved, for the practitioner, the patient and the client who brought them in. And um, there's a vet on Kauai who, um, Dr. Basco, I'm sure a lot of people know of him. And, you know, he's this amazing holistic vet who, uh, over the years, he's had practices kind of almost like that, where he has it outdoors with like a picnic table. And um, so he's always inspired me too to have kind of a non-traditional um, practice setting. So, um, yeah, you know, and, and it, once I finally got my own space and you know, left and started working in my own, my own environment. And I was like, what do I want to create? And I basically wanted to make it like a spa. And so, um, you know, it's not a spa without the music. Like if you go into any nice place, it's just silent. It's just going to be this like kind of awkward, uncomfortable, like, um, just not, there's something missing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it all kind of came together where I started playing the harp a few years ago and, you know, started dreaming this, this vision at the same time. And everything kind of came together where it was like, yeah, like the music is really the big piece. Um, and just the, the sound environment, like the noise pollution cutting down on that, you know, that's a big thing that I talk about a lot is like one aspect of sound therapy is removing the bad noises and then you introduce the good noises. And then it's like, you, you kind of took care of the whole, the whole situation. Um, and so now I'm also creating my own music that is like, um, you know, my own creation that then I can have it ready to go and made for my own sessions. And so I know exactly what it's going to sound like and try to make it super calming for a pet's ears in particular, not like too many like high pitched things going on to kind of like, well, like stimulate them or like, you know, heavy bass moments where it's like vibrating the speaker too mm -hmm. much. Um, there's just a lot of little elements that as a musician, I can kind of pick up on that, like knowing what would be a little intense for me um, as a sensitive, sensitive person, and then putting myself in their, um, in their paws and knowing like what their super sensitive hearing is going to be distracted by. So those are some of my thoughts on the, all the music things and how that got started. Yeah, well it it makes so much sense because as you were talking about that um acupuncture specifically i know if i take my cat in to the vet's office to get acupuncture done versus having my vet come to my home and do it there is a big difference i notice a big difference i notice that she kind of shakes out the needles a lot quicker in the office she's more tense and so i don't know that she gets the full effect that we're going for if I take her into the office to have it done versus having having my vet come here to do it. And it's still, it, it, it's interesting because she walks in the door with like music playing in her pocket. And so she just keeps it going the whole time. And it is very soothing and it is very spa-like. And I never really kind of put that together until you just said that. Yeah, I do house calls too for that same reason because some pets they just do a lot better at home or you know if at least if you're if they're bringing if, when they come in it feels more like a someone's home instead of a clinic then they're like like we're just in a new place and I can explore and it's not not that scary atmosphere but yeah the the music I think it's also just gives more of like a grounding presence for everybody like if there's some nice music playing there's something that just feels a little more special and like um almost sacred about the experience you're having it keeps you in the moment you're not just like thinking off too much of 
you know, all your thoughts, it kind of keeps you there a little bit more grounded for, for myself. So one of the things that I've just started maybe in the past year or so learning about and um, admittedly, I need to learn a lot more about it, but it is because I've really been on this kind of, I guess, spiritual journey um, and tapping into myself, grounding myself and my dog about to bark. I'm sorry. I'm going to hold on to her so maybe she'll stop barking. Right. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things that I have been learning about are all the different like frequencies and how they can help us get into these different states. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same for, for our pets and something like choosing the type of instrument that, you, that you're using, like the heart, like I'm, that can be especially calming. I would imagine is that, yeah. does that, the harp yeah. is like, you know, it sounds, everything you play on the harp sounds like a lullaby. So, yeah. you know, it's like, if it's okay for a baby, that's another thing to think of is like, what kind of music would you play for an infant? And think of that as like your dog, because they have a pretty equally sensitive in some ways, uh, nervous system. And like, you don't want to startle a little baby. So it's the same thing for your dog. Um, but yeah, you know, it's cool what you were saying about your spiritual journey too, because music is, I think, a big part of a lot of spiritual practices. Um, if you think about it, all traditional spiritual practices and even modern have a musical component. So even ranging from like music that's played in churches and like choirs and organs and things like that. Or if you look at shamanic traditions, they'll use more of like singing and using rattles and other um, traditional instruments. Music is used for celebrating. It's used for grieving and healing. And so it's really a thing I think we take for granted, but it's a very powerful component of life. And everyone has the music that they like and they don't like. And so it's important, I think, if you want to, to explore that and see, you know, what type of music makes you feel good. And, you know, having that spill over into like your well-being being enhanced. And then that is beneficial for your dog. You know, that's one big picture way of doing it. But then if we're getting more into like a practical setting of using it on a, um, a patient, there are other ways to use sound therapy. Like, for example, tuning forks are really cool. And I love them also because, you know, a pet owner can use can learn to use them and do it themselves. And so if someone is interested in learning maybe acupressure points and then they get a set of tuning forks, the nice thing about the tuning forks is that they're very gentle. And so they're not going to be hurting your pet. You know, if they happen to not like it, they might get up and walk away. But it's not like a needle where you're going to be penetrating the skin or doing anything um, invasive. But some of the, the tuning fork methods would be like, um, they have different types. Some are more high pitched and more for like clearing the space. So you might use it like off the body, more maybe for a human. Um, the ones I like to use for animals are actually, you can't even really hear them. They vibrate very intensely. And so when you strike it, you then apply the um, the stem of the fork to certain points. And that point gets vibrated and stimulated in the same way that the needle would stimulate it, but in a, a different way where it's more using like a sound wave to interact with the tissue. And there's actually evidence that shows it can help to release um, the fascia and that type of tissue that's be beneath the skin and overlaying the muscles. So it can mm -hmm. be good for musculoskeletal issues. You can use it on calming points that can help to relax the patient. And, um, you know, there's like many other applications for it too. So if people are interested in sound therapy and in addition to exploring the types of music that you like, the kind of um, whether it's like spa music or like some reggae or something, something that feels good, then you could maybe look into learning more about tuning forks and that type of vibrational therapy. Um, sound bowls are another good one that are easy for anyone to learn and play. And you can, you know, buy your own set of sound bowls and play them. It's a really nice way to have like an active meditation practice. Um, for me, I have a hard time just sitting down and meditating. I'm like way too um, 
like go, go, go. And so if I'm like, I'm going to sit down and play my bowls for 20 minutes. I can get in this like really nice uh, flow state and just kind of like a Zen mindset where I have no thoughts going through my mind, but it, it's something that I'm doing that's active with my body and my hearing and sensing and feeling the vibrations. Um, but it's not so much of just like sitting there in silence being like, okay, I have to not think for, not think any thoughts, even though I'm thinking thoughts. <laughs> so sound yeah. balls are really good way. And my cats always come and just like lay right next to them when I'm doing it. And other animals have experienced that too. Or they're just like, oh, this feels good. I'm going to come over here and take a nap. <laughs> yeah. That makes me think the tuning forks kind of make me think of the, um, tapping, but like more intense. Yeah. yeah. And just a different sensation. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it's also important to differentiate acupuncture should only be done by a veterinary professional, yep. but acupressure is something that a pet parent could learn to yeah, do. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so what would, when you're doing this different sound therapy with animals, one of the, well, okay. One of the things that I was thinking when you were talking about the fascia, have you noticed um, improvement in like lipomas and things like that? So like the the st any stagnation, like you're kind of releasing what's going on. Because that's one thing that I find. I know they can be mostly you know considered superficial, but like people have a really hard time with with them like we just can't seem to get rid of them no matter yeah. what we do a lot of times have you noticed that that's something that can be improved that's a good point i've actually never even thought of that when it comes to like soft tissue masses um so that's a, a way that you could potentially try to address it i haven't seen my own like firsthand results with that i'll sometimes use herbs more so to try to treat stagnation mm -hmm. um but yeah, I mean, it's it's good, like out of the box thinking like that of different things to try. Um, one of the ways I like to use it, though, is like if an um, animal is too reactive to other types of hands on therapies, like if they're in a lot of pain and it's hard to do needling or even like massage in certain spots. Um, just using the tuning forks can be really powerful. So if you have a dog with really bad arthritis you know, you can um, look up the acupressure points around that location and then use the tuning fork around there. And just getting, um, you know, when you're saying stagnation and talking about it, like a tumor or a lump, that's, that's kind of one type of stagnation, but another could be joint stagnation. And so I've definitely seen good results with the vibration um, relieving joint stagnation because it's literally sound waves travel better through water than they do through the air and so um, that's kind of the basis for shockwave therapy which is another type of technically sound therapy where it's using very powerful sound waves to um, penetrate through tissue and so um, yeah that would be a, a really cool way to think of like treating stagnation with a physical modality and something gentle like a tuning fork you know an owner could do that every day if they wanted to and try to um, you know, maybe use the tuning fork around the joint and then do some gentle range of motion and warm it up and get the joint joint uh, fluid moving. Those are things that like, if you're doing that every day, your dog's arthritis will be more of a main maintenance type of thing instead of progressing and worsening, hopefully, in addition that's, to whatever else you're able to do. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think even if your pet doesn't have any sort of disease or ailment going on. One of the the big takeaways that I remember I took from the original Forever Dog book was this this idea of like constant increased cortisol and how it can decrease our lifespan and certainly the quality of life. And so this to me sounds like something that's just perfect for like overall maintaining more of a state of calm mm -hmm. in the body. Definitely. Yeah. I think um, taking a sound inventory in your household of like what sounds are is your dog or cat exposed to throughout the day, um, you know, whether that's like 
construction going on, um, you know, kids, other pets, appliances, um, you know, the car, just like everything, like really take a few minutes to like think through and be like, what are all the things they're hearing, whether they recognize them or not, and um, how those could be playing into that cortisol, because it's like any sound that you don't recognize is going to stimulate you a bit and like your brain's trying to interpret what it is. And then um, thinking through what type of practice you could implement of maybe um, when you get home at the end of the day, you put on some nice music and feed your dogs their dinner and, you know, go take a shower while they do that so that it's quiet while they're eating. That's one of my favorite tips is like having this nice routine of kind of like letting your pets have their food in a um, the calmest environment possible. Just like when, if you went out to a nice restaurant, you would want to just like relax and dine and um, have this ambiance that's just that makes you feel good so that you're not like, oh, I'm like in the drive through McDonald's, like just shoving this hamburger in my face. <laughs> just how a lot of pets seem to eat where they're just like in this huge hurry. And I know some of them are loving it, but others, I think they have anxiety where they're like, resource guarding or feeling competitive with other pets and maybe making sure that everyone has their own little spot to just sit and enjoy their food and there's some nice background music going on and like you're maybe in another room doing something quiet so that they can relax and have that five or ten minutes to have their time you know just little things like that where if that's your daily routine 90 percent of the time hormone levels will change like it will have a difference just like it would for yourself if you implemented like a daily yoga practice or breathing techniques or something like that it's the little things I think really do add up over their lifetime so are there any plans of when you create this music are you going to make it available for sale put it on spotify yeah everything's in the works right now I'm hoping to have an album out and you know like on the streaming platforms by the end of the year um i already have a 30 minute long like sound healing see um audio that you can listen to and um it's on my website under my resources page drbarrettvet.com slash resources and so if you want to check it out you know that's on there and so that's an original recording with the harp and the sound bowls and some synthesizers for like some background atmosphere um it's kind of the first round so there's a lot more that i want to to do with it but um you know we're just getting started i have a few friends who are also musicians and pet owners who are like really passionate about contributing and making this happen so it's become a really fun new project to you know kind of all everyone with their pets they're like oh they're anxious we need we need to make our own music for them and kind of make this happen so it's been really fun and yeah there there will be some available soon um and you know hopefully it would be really cool if people are using it in their homes or if you're a practitioner and you're using it during your sessions you know the goal is that it would be designed with the pets in mind so that it's um the most calming for them as possible that's awesome so we're tell me your website one more time Yep, it's drbarrettvet.com slash resources. Okay. And um, there's a bunch of free downloads and stuff on there, including one that says um, music therapy for dogs. And there's like a PDF that goes with it and then a link to the website. It's on Vimeo. Oh, okay, awesome. And then where can people find you on social media? Yep, so I have um, a few accounts it, Original Instagram is Dr. Barrett Vet, and it's B A R R E T T. My practice is called Muse Holistic Vet, and um, so those are my socials on Facebook. It's just if you look up either or Dr. Megan Barrett or Muse Holistic Veterinary Care, and so that's where I'm at on um, those platforms. And then yeah, there's a lot of resources on my websites and. I know anyone is ever always welcome to reach out with questions or, um, you know, if, if my tech stuff isn't working, just reach out and I'll get back to you. Some of my stuff is password protected and that can be glitchy sometimes. So if you're ever trying to access my resources and having issues, just send an email and we'll, we'll make sure you can get to it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and introducing us to 
um, sound therapy for uh, our animals. And I highly encourage everyone to start following Dr. Barrett on social media because she posts this kind of stuff all the time. And um, I know I want to know, so I'm sure you want to know when this music will be available in addition to what is already on her website. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for uh, furthering the message of, you know, more just holistic care for our animals, integrative care for our animals. And I, I appreciate you. So thank you so much. Yes, right back at you. I appreciate being on here and um, getting to speak to your audience and connecting more. So um, look forward to seeing you in person again, yeah. hopefully this year.